place to celebrate the life of Otto Ritter. And let me be quick to add, this is not at all how Otto envisioned his going home service to look like. In fact, some of you are aware that Otto has been planning this day for quite some time. And he fully expected all of his family, all of his friends, and all of his acquaintances to be able to meet together in one place. But since COVID restrictions don't allow that at present, this situation has forced us to be creative. And so with the help of technology and with the help of talented media techies, you may be watching this service right now, live streaming to your home or wherever you happen to be. Welcome to this celebration of Otto's life. And yes, it's a celebration. But it's also a sacred moment. It's sacred because this afternoon we honor the life of a wonderful husband and father. We honor the life of someone who left behind a legacy. We honor a father whose life served as a godly role model for his children and grandchildren. But it's also sacred because for every one of us in this room, for everyone watching wherever you happen to be, we're reminded and we're called to come face to face with the realization of how short life really is and how quickly the years spin by and how quickly life passes here on this earth. That's something that we all need to recognize. And this afternoon, we can do just that as we reflect on Otto's life and as we take the time to reflect on the existence of life after death. It's hard to believe that for Otto, his journey on this earth is over and God has seen fit to call him to himself. As you know, these last few years have been especially hard for Otto and for you family members in his journey here on earth as he struggled with some of the things that he had to deal with, things that caused him concern, things that were especially hard for him to handle. In fact, in the weeks leading up to this day, it was Otto's prayer that God would call him home in his sleep. And God answered that prayer in the early hours of January the 1st. Now, for all of us who remain behind, friends, relatives, family members. We're the ones that have to make the adjustments. We're the ones that have to deal with the changes and we're the ones who need to be encouraged. And I want to tell you this afternoon that God is the God of all comfort on whom we can call when we need it most. One of my favorite verses is found in Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 27, that says, The eternal God is our refuge, and underneath are his everlasting arms. That's a promise that we can hold on to. That's a promise that gives us confidence. And that's a promise that gives us hope. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this afternoon, we acknowledge again that you are the creator of all things, that your love towards us is everlasting, that your mercy knows no limits. You are our refuge 
and strength. You surround us with your ever-loving arms, and you hold the key to life and death. Father, we come to you today with our hearts open and our arms outstretched, trusting you to reach down and comfort our hearts that are hurting today. That you would comfort us with your presence and comfort us with the promises of your word. Lord, as we remember Otto, as we celebrate his life, I ask that you would extend your grace towards us. I ask that you would give us your comfort during these moments together. And I ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it, and it is gone and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. The first time I remember having a conversation with Otto Ritter was when I walked down the road to the home of the cute boy down the street to invite him to my 16th birthday party. And I had the invitation in hand and rang the doorbell and Otto Ritter answered the door. And quickly, when he saw that I wanted to invite his young son to a party, he vetted me. He started asking me lots of questions. And he wanted to kind of determine if he would allow his son to attend my celebration or not. A few weeks after Matt attended my sweet 16, fully approved by Otto, I had another opportunity to visit with Otto Ritter. Only this time it was at Ross Haven Bible Camp. I was volunteering as the assistant cook in the kitchen for family camp, and I saw Otto making his way through the food line to pick up his meal, and I asked him, hey, where's that cute son of yours? And about seven months later, that cute son and I started dating. Now, Otto has five sons, and they're all cute, <laughs> but the one that I'm referring to is Matt. Fast forward 30 years later, and I have the honor through that marriage to be called daughter-in-law to Otto Ritter. What an honor that has been. 
Dad enjoyed a lot of things. He was actually very active in a lot of ways. And at one time, I can remember him being active in golf. And I ended up having the task of being the golf cart driver. And I did not realize that there was one specific way to drive a golf cart, at least according to Otto Ritter. There was one way, the only way, the right way to drive that golf cart. And he instructed me on what that one way was. Now the Psalm, Psalm 103 that I just read to you, this comes from God's word and in God's word there is clear instruction on the one way, the right way, the only way to guarantee that we have an assurance that once we leave earth, we will be with God in heaven. And that's through our relationship with Jesus Christ. So just as Psalm 103 was a very important piece of scripture to dad, there's other words, of course, in this Bible that were so important to him. And one of those are the words that Jesus prayed to his Father in heaven, and we commonly call it the Lord's Prayer. And I would like to share the words of the Lord's Prayer with you now, because they were also very dear to Otto's heart. So the Lord's Prayer is found in Matthew 6, and I will read 9 to verse 13. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So if you're anything like me, then maybe growing up in school, you had weekly assemblies where you would recite the Lord's Prayer. And, you know, once you have words recited in your mind and you know them, sometimes you kind of forget the meaning behind them. They're just a vain repetition. So I'm just going to take a a brief moment today just to kind of unpack what some of these words and some of these phrases from the Lord's Prayer actually mean. So first of all, there's that word our, and that reminds us that through God, we are united as a community. And so although we are a small group here in person, we just thank you on behalf of the Ritter family for each and every person who is united as part of our community today. Thank you. And then there's the word father. And of course, this is very important because it reminds us that God gives us the opportunity to be his child if we want to be. We're not his servant. We're not just this assembly line product that he made. But each and every one of us is a precious and unique child of God. And then there's the word hallowed. And this adjective is a wonderful word to combined with father. He's a hallowed father. He is holy and he's perfect. And not just kind of the run-of-the-mill regular dad that maybe our dad was. You know, Otto was the very first person to say, I was not perfect. I sinned just like, you know, you and me both. Um, he did, however, know the guy, the big man upstairs, who could forgive him of all of those wrongdoings, who could wipe his slate clean, erase the record, remove his sin as far as east is from the west, just like I read in Psalm 103. And your kingdom come, well, this is especially important today because it describes the promise of an eternal home, a place where there's no dying, where there's no sadness, where there's no pain, where our dad is now, today, and where we can be someday with him. And our daily bread, well, of course, this refers to food and, and our basic needs, but it also refers to the spiritual sustenance that we can have because Christ is the bread of life. And anyone who feeds on the bread of life will live forever. Forgive us as we've forgiven. 
This is an important part of the prayer because this is where it kind of turns the page. It's where we stop. It's where we reflect on the way that we interact with other people, on our attitudes, on the love that we do or don't show, on the mercy that we do or don't have towards other people. And it reminds us to give that transformative grace, that patience that God has given to us, to others. Lead us not into temptation. Well, that's a request, just saying, hey, God, can you please steer us clear of things that would lead us away from you? And finally, deliver us from evil. Just an appeal to God to say, God, can you please free me? Can you protect me from the devil's grip? And I wanted to share the summary of the words of the Lord's Prayer with you today because it's really important that you know that this prayer and all of the, the components of it, the petitions within it, were basically the moral compass that Otto Ritter lived by. The points to revere God, to accept his will, to know his word, to love each other through forgiveness, to resist evil. Kind of sounds like a tall order. In fact, it's impossible for any of us to do on our own. But it's fully possible when we have accepted Jesus' sacrifice in place of our sins, when we've given Jesus permission to take control, to enable us to pray these words sincerely, just as Otto Ritter often did. And now I'd like to pass on the baton to Uncle John. John Ritter will come forward and share with us the eulogy. It's been a real privilege and an honor, Des and family, to be invited to share the eulogy on behalf of my brother Otto. I am John, the youngest of seven children, and there's only the two of us left, my brother Chris and I. And so today, as we gather here in this place, we want to honor a life that was well lived. And so I will now read the eulogy. Otto Richard Ritter, 84, of Lacombe, Alberta, united with the Lord and Savior in heaven on January the 1st, 2021, passing peacefully in his sleep. Otto was born to George and Emma in Lisburn, Alberta, at the family homestead on August 10th, 1936. Otto attended school until grade nine when a farm cat jumped on a cow, causing the cow to jump on Otto. He sustained serious injury of a crushed leg. Initially, he went to the hospital in Merthyr for a cast, but he ended up in Edmonton as surgery was inevitable. Once healed up, Otto took a construction job building the highway with Molson Construction. This job took him to different areas of Alberta. Between jobs, he would return home, and this is when he met his future wife, Desiree. The job enabled Otto to pay off his medical debt and buy his first car. When he turned 24, he managed to save up enough money for his goal of getting into business, he chose to buy a BA service station and restaurant in Fox Creek. Also around this time, he re reconnected with his sweetheart, Desiree, and they soon married in Edmonton on August 20th, 1960. Otto ran the BA for 10 years, and in this time, he and Desiree had their first four sons, Rick, Alan, Chris, and Shane. Besides spending time on the business, Otto truly enjoyed helping people out. 
and got very involved in his community. He was instrumental in bringing in and remodeling a community hall, an ice rink, and a curling rink. Otto and Des learned how to curl, and Otto spent many years as a skip, collecting a pile of trophies along the way. Otto was involved with the Lions Club too. Also during these 10 years, Otto purchased a small trailer court on the hill. Over the years, he expanded the Peace Pipe Trailer Court, later renaming it to K-Bob Trailer Park, from eight stalls to 44 stalls. When an opportunity to build a trailer court in Grand Cache came a few years later, Otto joined forces with his partner, Donnie Williams, to build Shannon Trailer Court. At this time, a pastor would come to Fox Creek once a month and hold a Sunday evening service. But Otto had dreams of Fox Creek offering much more than that. Otto was asked to assist two government men in future planning for Fox Creek. After lots of long, late night meetings, all of the work paid off. And in 1967, Fox Creek became a town. Otto's years of care for Fox Creek was acknowledged in 1985 when he received the high honor of Citizen of the Year. In 1970, Otto sold his service station and had grand plans of retirement, but he soon got bored and decided to drive a bus instead. He also had lots of time to assist Pastor Sam Eels with the building of the community chapel. Otto, Otto became foreman of that project and saw so many special answers to prayer. Building must have been in, the blood, uh, in his blood at this time because Otto and Desiree also built their new home on the hill close to the trailer court. They continued to build their family and as they were blessed with a, and as they were blessed with a baby girl, Amber, not long afterwards, Matthew was born as the grand finale. Otto took a contract with Hudson Bay maintaining 172 houses for 15 years. Despite this commitment, he continued to be involved at the church and serve on the board. He taught Sunday school. He gave a hand in the operation of the Christian school. He was dedicated in his ministries of Ross Haven Bible Camp at Lake St. Anne and volunteered on the board there, helping as a camp counselor or with maintenance every summer. Otto enjoyed the outdoors, and he had many fond memories fishing, hunting with his brothers and children. For several years, the annual goose hunt in the fall was a huge highlight often followed by a big game hunt. From time to time, his friends from Three Hills would, would even come up to participate. Fifteen years after his initial contract with Hudson Bay, they sold their homes to their employees, which encouraged Otto to take a real estate course. Of course, he passed. So, the work, so he worked for Merv Zadry, selling those homes, and several others for the next 15 years. During this time, Otto's six children grew up, went away for school, started careers, and married. Before long, Papa Otto had 23 grandchildren. Six of those grandchildren are now married, and Papa was blessed to be the great-grandfather to eight great-grandchildren. One of Otto's greatest legacies was praying, specifically by name, for each of his family members, and there's a lot of them. And I'd just like to mention here, too, that Otto was also very involved in all kinds of mission work, and he, he financially supported, and he also gave of so much time for that. Otto and Desiree decided to move from Fox Creek to Lacombe in 2005. As many of their children had moved away, 
and they thought it was prudent to be closer to their for more health care options. Otto continued to receive accolades of his deeds, including the Alberta Medal from Premier Klein, recognizing his outstanding service to the people of Alberta. Otto was involved with the Yellowhead Conservative constituency, while Cliff Brightcruz was the federal MP. In Lacombe, he joined the Gideons and thoroughly enjoyed visiting the schools and presenting Bibles to the grade five students. As Ross Haven was a little further down the road, Otto became involved with Camp Silverside on Gull Lake. He served as their treasurer for many years. Building Blocks, a store that raises money for Lacombe Christian Schools was privileged to have Otto regularly volunteer. He would help people find treasures and sometimes purchase a hidden gem or two for himself. With his political involvement and all his wisdom that he had collected throughout the years, Otto would meet with the guys on weekday mornings at the local ANW. Of course, to serve, to, of course, he had to solve all the world's problems. He began facing mental he began facing health channel challenges. In 2010, Otto had some heart issues that would likely require a valve replacement. But just before the impending surgery, a test discovered that half of his heart was very weak, which ruled out surgery as an option. The right medication soon improved his heart function considerably. Otto's serotonin imbalance was bittersweet, unmanaged, it would produce overwhelming depression, but it led Otto to be sympathetic to others and their struggles, as he understood the realities of mental health. On December 3rd, 2016, Otto fell and he broke his C7 in his neck. A surgery of two 12-inch rods and 13 screws along with physiotherapy and was necessary for the recovery. Otto's driven personality prevailed and with incredible determination, he set out to do the required physio exercises and times that by two. Many thought that his strict regimen left him healthier than before breaking his neck. In 2017, Otto was diagnosed with non-cancerous brain tumor, situated in a position that would be tricky to operate on. One of the side effects of the tumor was loss of hearing and balance. Otto forged forward with his walker and would zip around Lacombe in his scooter whenever the weather permitted it. Despite all these setbacks, he remained full of joy, peace to his very end day, sharing the good news of Jesus at every opportunity. He even prepared a message expressing God's truth and the gift of salvation to be shared with people after Otto left earth, to be eternally present with his Lord in heaven. Otto is survived by his loving wife of 60 years, Desiree Ritter, along with his six children, Rick, Alan and Carolyn, Chris and Elaine, Shane and Alana, Amber and Brian, and Matthew and Athena, and 23 grandchildren, Leanne, Brent, Nelson, Lyle, Joel, Rhett, Sean, Cody and Jennifer, Ashley and Nathan, Jared and Jesse, David, Heather, Sarah, Robert and Carly, Savannah, Jacqueline, Russell, Calvin, Sam, Mitch and Anita, Justin, 
Megan, Keanu, and Matika, and nine great-grandchildren. Brother Chris and John, as well as Brother Chris and John, he will also be remembered by his sisters and brother-in-laws, nieces, nephews, and many friends. Otto was predeceased by his parents, George and Emma. Brother Gus, Brother Henry, Brother Rudy, and his sister Anne. I would also like to personally share a few things before I close. And uh, first, uh, Brother Chris Des and family passes on his condolences to you today as a family. And he would have loved to have been here, but because of COVID, of course, that did not permit. You know, as I read this eulogy, there was a part in there that talked about some of the things Otto loved to do, and of course, there was fishing and hunting and all that. And it mentioned that one of the big things was the goose hunt in the fall. And I couldn't resist, but put a little bit of thought into that because that was a great highlight for myself as well. Now you have to recognize that Brother Otto was, is a real organizer and our goose hunt every fall involved about 12 of us. There was cousins and nieces or nephews and, uh, and friends of Otto. And uh, so there was about 12 of us and Otto would organize this every fall. And of course, being that he was the organizer, the organizer is the one that calls the shots. And Otto was the kind of guy, he had a goose call. And a goose call is the thing that you blow into. And it's either going to attract the geese or it's going to send them away. And of course, we'd be all in our blinds and uh, set up out early in the morning in the field. And uh, Otto would sit there in his, in his blind with his goose call already, and when the geese would start coming in, he'd start blowing. Now, if he blew right, the geese would keep coming in, and we'd have a tremendous hunt. But if he blew wrong, they just off they'd go, and they were gone. And of course, then he had to contend with us, my, uh, me as one of the brothers, and my other brother, and his own kids, criticizing him for the way he blew that thing. They said, can't you blow it right? But uh, so we, we, you know, we laughed about it and, uh, and that was the way it went. But uh, there was one thing about it. If Otto did blow it right and the geese came in, boy, there was 12 of us hunting with shotguns. And uh, then we had to, uh, after the hunt, if we had a good hunt that morning, we had to go gather up all the geese in the field and sometimes, I think, we had to ask the Lord for some forgiveness because we were only allowed five each. The other thing I would like to just share a little bit about is how competitive Otto was. And you know, Otto was a good hunter, not even a question about it, a good hunter and a good fisherman. And, uh, and uh, so he, he, uh, he, he was a good shot. But there was one thing that bothered Otto, and that's being so competitive. He had a son, and his name is Rick. And his son Rick, we all, had, we all came to the conclusion his son Rick could outshoot Otto and the rest of us probably two to one. And uh, so anyway, this bothered Otto, and I could tell it was bothering him. And so as time went along, one fall I came up there and Otto was so excited, and he came running over to me with his, new sh with his shotgun, and he said, John, I got to show you something. And I said, yes, well, what is it, Otto? And he said, look at this. And he had a, a scope put onto a shotgun. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with that, scopes are very common with rifles and 22s, but not very common with shotguns. But Otto had to be competitive. He had to try to get that extra goose. So anyway, he hands me the gun, and he says, take a look at this. So I picked up the gun, and I'm looking through his scope, and uh, <laughs> I said, Otto, uh, yeah, it magnifies everything. It looks great, but uh, how do I know where to shoot? 
And he says, John, look at it. And I said, well, I am looking at it. He says, well, don't you see the red dot? And I said, what red dot? He said, the red dot in the middle of the scope. And then he started to laugh. And Otto could laugh. He laughed because he realized and he remembered that four of his brothers are colorblind, which I'm one. And so the red dot meant nothing. So, uh, yeah, that was, we had some tremendous times together. But, you know, the, Otto and I were very close. And the last few weeks we talked, probably almost on a weekly basis through modern technology, we were able to do that with the help of TELUS. And Otto always told me every time, he said, John, I'm a day closer to glory. I'm a day closer to glory. And, I, and we talk about heaven and we talk about our children and grandchildren, and we, we just had a good visit together. But you know, as it was mentioned earlier on in our eulogy, Otto had won these awards. He, he was such a giving person. He was very generous in every way. And yet, in all of this, even, when, even being awarded by P Premier Klein, the award of Citizen of the Year, you know, Otto knew that was not going to bring him into eternity because he knew that good works do not bring salvation. Only Jesus Christ brings salvation. And Otto had made that decision at a very young age to serve the Lord, and that was his motto in life, was to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to others. And he knew in his heart he had committed his life. That is who he was going to serve. And so he said to me the last week I talked to him, I guess it was about a week before he passed on, he says, on my tombstone, I want put on there Joshua 24, 15, which says, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Thank you.
I would like to share a few words with you all. First of all, my darling Des, honey, we've had a very close relationship, and I prayed that God would continue to comfort and bless you. To my children and their families, I love you all and have prayed daily that not one of you would be lost eternally. I pray that you would all accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And I also have a request for all of you. That is, that you will spend a lot of time with Dez. I hope that there is not a dozen of you at the house on Sunday and nobody the rest of the week. Now to both family and friends, I want to share this message with you. The Holy Bible is God's love letter to mankind, and it tells us that there are two roads we all face when we die, heaven or hell. See, when God created Adam and Eve, he did not make them robots. He gave them a choice. He put them in the Garden of Eden that was beautiful and had everything they needed. God also planted one fruit tree which they were not to eat from. If they did, they would die. It seems it was not very long after they, they disobeyed God and ate of the fruit tree. God had to remove them from the garden because now they were sinners and were going to die, going to a lost eternity. But God in his great love for man had a plan. God is a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus the Son would come to this fallen world, be born a sinless man, and would pay for our sins by dying for us. Now we have a choice. We could accept what Jesus has done for us and go to heaven, or we could reject him and go to hell. The choice is ours. Remember, there is no other way. I hope to see you all in glory one day. And I love you all very much. Some time ago, Otto invited me to his house because he told me he had something that he wanted to tell me. And so I went. When I got there, he told me that he had made, he wanted to make some plans for his funeral service and that he had made a video message that he wanted played 
at his funeral. And I might add, he was quite excited about it. After all, it's not every day that you get to speak at your own funeral service. So what can I say about Otto? Well, if you knew Otto, Otto was Otto. He was always straightforward and to the point. If he had to say something, and he had something to say, often he said it, whether you wanted to hear it or not, but you could handle it coming from him. He was always quick to encourage and to commend things when they were well done. Otto was a man who lived out his days with one eye fixed on eternity. Whether he was working with the Gideons, volunteering his time to support the Christian school in some way, shape, or form, even picking up people who were shut in to meet for coffee and for a visit at Tim Hortons or a &W, or serving as a board member at Camp Silversides, among other things, he always made time for things that mattered. He always made time for things that were important. Even after his hearing was gone, he encouraged me, and I think all of us at church, by showing up almost every Sunday morning, usually accompanied by someone who would be his scribe. And boy, did he love his family. He frequently shared some of the milestone events of your lives. And I know he prayed for each one of you, often and regularly. But right now, we're dealing with mixed emotions. On the one hand, there is the emotion of great sadness. Not sadness for Otto, mind you, because we know that as a child of God, he's in a far better place. But sadness because we've lost someone we've grown to love and appreciate and depend on. On the other hand, there are emotions of great joy. Because we can know that at this very moment, Otto is far better off than he's ever been before. And because of the relationship that Otto had with the Lord Jesus Christ, he's in his presence right now, rejoicing. Amen? The Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, So we are always confident, knowing that, while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Now listen, because verse 7 goes on to say, For we walk by faith, not by sight. And then Paul sums it up by saying in verse 8, We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. I want to remind you this afternoon that for a Christian, there is no greater joy than to be in the presence of the one who loves us like no one else can. So today is not a day of mourning, but a day of celebration. It's really not a day of regret, but truly a day of rejoicing. I want to take a few minutes this afternoon to look at a rather familiar passage of Scripture that reminds us of some of the promises that await those who walk by faith and not by sight. And promises for those who share a relationship with the Lord Jesus. The verses I want to read to you are found in John chapter 14. And in those verses, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He knows that he'll be leaving them soon, and he's preparing them for that time, and he says to them, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that where I am, there you may be also. And then in verse 4 we read, You know the way to the place where I'm going. 
And then one of the disciples, Thomas, he speaks up and he says to Jesus, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus answers him in verse 6 by saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I got to tell you, I love this passage of Scripture. I love the promises that these verses present. And this afternoon, I want to take just a few minutes to unpack some of those promises. The first promise that Jesus makes to Christians is that we don't have to fear death. We don't have to fear death. Do you remember what Jesus said in the passage I just read? He said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't let this thing throw you. Don't get bent out of shape about this. You know something? There are a lot of things in life that can throw us, that can get us bent out of shape. Statisticians tell us that there's an overwhelming number of people who are troubled because they don't know what will happen to them when they die. But the fact remains, Jesus has taken the fear out of death. That's good news, people. He has conquered the grave. He has defeated death. He's been there, done that. And because of that, as Christians, we no longer have to be afraid. In the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 17 and 18, Jesus encourages us with these words. He says, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. But there's another thing that can really trouble us, that can really throw us for a loop, that can get us bent out of shape, and that is, you know, we we get really messed up, or we can get really messed up when we view death as an end instead of a beginning, right? A number of years ago, when preacher and evangelist D.L. Moody came to the end of his life, he said, someday soon you're going to read in the newspaper that I'm dead. Don't believe it for a moment. I'll be more alive than ever before. Now, the thing that really gets us messed up is this. We have a really hard time getting our head around the fact that there is life after death, don't we? Just for a moment, just for the sake of trying to illustrate that, picture two children in a mother's womb. And for the sake of argument, imagine that these twins in the womb are able to converse with each other. They can talk to each other. They can debate about what's possibly on the outside, and the one says to the other, you know, there's a whole world out there. I hear that out there, there are grassy fields, there are mountains and streams, there are garden beds that bloom with all sorts of colors. Let me tell you, out there, there are horses and dogs and cats, there are all sorts of other animals, and there are people just like us, only much bigger, and they can walk and run and jump and fish and uh, play soccer and hockey. Out there, there are skyscrapers, highways, towns, and cities, and very soon, we're going to leave here. And we're going to go to that place and join them in that world. Now, the other twin who's been kind of listening to this speech scrunches up his face and he says, are you crazy? I mean, have you gone completely off your rocker? I mean, get real. There is no life after birth. The point that I'm trying to make is this. Reality isn't determined by the limits of our ability to understand or believe. Life after birth is real, even if unborn children can't imagine it. And let me tell you this afternoon, life after death is real, even if we can't imagine it. For Otto, life is not over. In fact, it's just begun. Otto has simply left behind the things that are temporary for the things that are eternal. He has left behind the things that are tarnished for the things that are spotless. And he has left the things that are passing for those things that are everlasting. Yes, our earthly bodies die, but our heavenly bodies will remain forever. 
I love how the Bible puts it all into perspective. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 and 9, we are reminded of this, where the writer writes, don't forget this one thing. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. Otto was ready to go home to be with Jesus, and he was so looking forward to that day. You know, I was always challenged by the, by the matter-of-fact way that Otto handled the hard stuff of life. But in the middle of dealing with all of his struggles, he had a quiet understanding and a very relaxed trust in his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And although he was challenged and frustrated with day-to-day -day living, he was not bent out of shape with dying. And he was not troubled with his future hope. The first promise to Christians is that we don't have to fear death. The second promise that we find in John chapter 14 is that Jesus is preparing a place for believers in heaven. As you're listening this afternoon, make yourself or ask yourself, so what what sorts of, what, what kind of a place has, has God prepared? I mean, what has God done in preparing that place for believers? Well, listen to the words of Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, where it says, And God will do this. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death. There will be no more sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. I wonder, can you even imagine a place like that? A place where there is no more sorrow. A place where there is no more crying. The Bible assures us that heaven is just such a place. A place where the hurts and disappointments of this world have no more sting. A place where the frustrations of life are replaced with unspeakable joys. A place where the pains of life are not permitted and where the failures of life no longer have control over us. A place with no more pain. I mean, think about it. Heaven won't have any handicapped parking spots. There won't be any pharmacies there. You'll never see a lineup to have your prescription filled. Heaven won't have hospitals or convenience clinics, nursing homes, or rehabilitation centers. It's amazing to imagine that for Otto right now, his days of aches and pains are over. Future trips to any doctor's appointments have been permanently canceled. And all of his past struggles are just memories. In fact, right now for Otto, all the things that he believed by faith, all the things that he lived for, all the things that he talked about loudly and regularly, all the things that he looked forward to with expectations have become reality. So as Christians, first, we don't have to fear death. And second, we can know that Jesus is preparing a place for believers in heaven. There's a third promise for Christians as we see it in John chapter 14, and that is Jesus will personally receive us there. Listen to the words of Jesus in John chapter 14, verse 3. Jesus said, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, I want you to, to imagine this. But the moment that Otto took his first breath in heaven, the Lord Jesus was right there to welcome him. And he didn't need his walker to get around. He left that behind. He didn't need pen and paper and, or maybe an iPad to communicate. His hearing was better than ever before. And he wasn't feeling the feebleness and the loss of strength he regularly struggled with in recent days while he was still with us. In fact, the first image that he saw was his Lord and Savior, Jesus. And there he was, with his arms wide open, 
to receive him in to that great mansion that he has prepared for all his children. And at that moment, Otto experienced a love that we can't even begin to understand. A love that forgave every failure that he's ever experienced in life. A love that mended the hurts that only he knew about. A love that understood every feeling that he's ever had before. A love that is unconditional and that completely satisfies the longing of our souls. But there's one more promise that we read about in John chapter 14. The last promise that I see in these verses I just read is that there is only one way to enter heaven. Listen to Jesus' words again. Verse 6 says, Jesus said to Thomas, Thomas, you say you don't know the way to heaven, but you do. I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. Now, I want you to understand this afternoon that more than anything else, Otto understood this. He understood that without a relationship with the Savior, there is no hope of heaven. He understood that Christ came up to take away the sins of the world, and that included his, and he believed in the, in the greatest promise given to all of us, found in three simple verses. Let me read them for you. In John chapter 3, verse 16 to 18, we read, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You see, Otto's life revolved around this promise. And because of his relationship with his Savior, he's in a place that we can't even begin to imagine yet. And he's experiencing a love that is incomprehensible. That day when I met with Otto to plan for his funeral, he handed me a tract that he had been handing out wherever he went, and perhaps you have received one or many of these tracts from him. And he said to me, make sure that when you preach at my service, you tell everyone that the journey of life is made up of two roads. He says, make sure that everyone who hears you understands that each one of us has to decide which road they will choose, which path they will take, which plan they will follow, and what kind of preparations they will make. As Otto said in his video just a few minutes ago, but God in his great love for you and me had a plan. Jesus would come to this fallen world, be born a sinless man, and would pay for our sins by dying for us in our place. But now we have a choice. Either we can accept what God has done for us and go to heaven, or we can reject him and go to hell. And Otto ends by saying, the choice is yours. There is no other way. Now, maybe you're thinking, you know, that's a little bit harsh. Don't you think? After all, I'm a pretty good person. Or maybe you're thinking, I'm still young. I've got lots of time to decide. There's so much stuff I want to do first. I'll decide later. Let me tell you a true story. Back in the spring of 1981, there was a young man who flew to Alaska to photograph the scenery and wildlife in the wilderness. You know, to pull something like that off, you don't just jump into a plane and head out. It takes proper preparation. And so lead, for months leading up to his departure, this young man diligently planned for everything he would need in order to make his adventure a success. Among other things, he packed 
a lot of photography equipment, 500 rolls of film. This was obviously pre-digital. He packed several firearms and 1,400 pounds of provisions. And then he left. And every day he journaled in his diary about the amazing scenery and wildlife that he saw. But as the months passed, his diary turned into a horrifying record of a nightmare. You see, this man had made plans to live in Alaska for a few months, but he forgot to make plans about how to get out. In August of 1981, he wrote in his diary, I think I should have used more foresight about arranging my departure. I'll soon find out. In November, his body was found in a valley over 200 miles from Fairbanks. And an investigation revealed that he had failed to make plans to exit Alaska. In Luke's Gospel, Jesus one day told an interesting parable about a rich man who was so successful that he didn't have room to store his abundant crops. And so he decided to tear down his barns and build bigger ones. He told himself, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take it easy. Eat, drink, be merry. You see, this guy assumed that he had many years to live, that his future looked rosy, that he had arrived, and that now he could kick back and relax and enjoy life. But God says to him in Luke 12, verse 21, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you, and now who's going to get what you've prepared for yourself? And Jesus adds these sobering words in verse 21. He says, that's exactly how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. You see, God called him a fool because this man thought he would live for many years to come. But he died that night. And God called him a fool because he didn't prepare for his exit from this life and for where he would spend eternity. I wonder this afternoon, have you made plans to exit from this life to the next. Have you planned for your departure? What road are you on? What path are you following? And will you accept God's free gift of salvation that is available to you today? The choice is yours. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God. Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot.
Make it count, leave a mark, build a name for yourself. Dream your dreams, chase your heart above all else. Make a name the world remembers. But all an empty world can sell is empty dreams. I got lost in the light, but it was up to me to make a name the world remembers. But Jesus is the only name to remember. And I, I don't want to leave a legacy. I don't care if they remember me. Only Jesus. And I. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we have just been reminded this afternoon that your faithfulness to us is so very great, that your mercies are new each and every day, and that you provide all we'll ever need. Thank you that you comfort us by your presence, that you comfort us through your word, and that you comfort us with your hope at any time, but especially at times like this. Thank you for the promises in your word that assures us that we can place our lives into your hands and that you desire a relationship with us. And Father, we especially ask for your comforting touch today as we commit Otto back to you. We ask that you would help us put life and living into proper perspective 
each day that we live for your glory. I ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you.